All right, here we go again. Let's see, I'm Jesse. I don't know if I need to introduce myself again. I have a wonderful wife who is actually in the building today. I'm super excited. I think I'm more nervous that she's sitting here than whether she's gone. I don't know. I am super excited to give this message. Um, it was a rough week, though. It was uh, it was one of those weeks where the devil wasn't playing fair. Like he and I don't want to give a bunch of attention to that guy because he doesn't even deserve to be talked about. But when you are doing work for God. He likes to think that he's sneaky, and he likes to try to uh, press you and push you and pull you and make you feel unworthy, and uh, it's just not fun, you know? And uh, it seems to be every time I give a message here, uh, my kids get sick, uh, I get sick, uh, something happens financially, uh, me and my wife won't necessarily have the best husband and wife week, you know what I mean? Just for transparency, uh, I think it's really funny that the way the devil works, he'll he'll press you and he'll do that. And uh, me and my wife had a disagreement, small disagreement over finances, going over new budget things. And I'm not a very budget friendly kind of guy. I like to, I like just like to. God always gives me the money and we spend it, and that's what it is. And every time we go out to go over a budget, I'm the one that has things that can be cut out. So it was just it was just fun. Um, and then after we got done arguing, I was like. How can I go give a message on Sunday when I don't even feel like a Christian? Are you kidding me? And then, you know, that's when you just, we're all humans, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just, I don't just want to give you guys transparency that I'm not uh, a fully functioning, 100% Jesus loving junkie. Well, I am, but I, sometimes I don't see myself that way. <clears throat> but he sees me that way. So, what's really fun is uh, anytime that we uh, fight about finances or disagree about finances, I'll go straight to the ATM and I'll take out 20 or 40 bucks and I'll go bless the first person I see. Because the devil doesn't get to win. He's going he's gonna to make me think I have so much finances that I have to argue about them. I don't think so. I don't think that's what God promised me when he said that I will give you everything that you need. Because if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And I want to be, I'm living in his will. So, He's going to fulfill it. So I think it's really funny when the devil squeezes me that way. He won't be squeezing me that way much longer because God gave me a strategy that I will go pull out that money that I think is important, and I'll go give it to somebody. And I get an opportunity to love them, and I get an opportunity to bless them. So I just want to encourage anybody, if, if something's going on in your life, just bless somebody, man. It, it just like The devil won't do it much longer for you. <clears throat> So the, the last message I gave was about intimacy with Jesus, and um, it's a little different because I'm an evangelist, so normally I just go to places, I drop the bomb, and then I leave, and that's it. And then I, I have this, this same message that I speak over and over again about intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy with Jesus is so important because he's the one, he, he, we're a bride, he's the bridegroom, and there's no one like you. So with that, I want to share once you're having your prayer time, once you're having your Bible reading time, once you're having this intimate relationship with Jesus, once you keep having this and having this and having this and having this and having this, this, you are filled to overflowing, okay? When you get out of your prayer, I don't know about you, but like when I have my time with Jesus in the morning, I cannot wait to get to work, mainly because I work around and with a lot of uh, hell-plundering Christians. So I know that when I get into my morning meeting, we are, the fire is stoked and it is ready. But uh, some of us don't work in that environment, and, but make that in your environment, you know? Start, start making them steps to make that in your environment. So if Jesus is overflowing in us because we have this relationship with him, what do we do with that overflow? And I think that God is really super cool because he gave us this overflow. He told us there was this overflow. And, and then he tells us and gives us an idea of what to do with it. So if you go to Matthew 28, okay, I got my notes just to make sure I'm on track before I go into the scripture. 
All right. Oh, I just wanted to also touch base on that uh, video that played uh, the send. I really highly encourage you guys to go to it. It is going to be an amazing, and maybe that's the evangelist in me speaking, but it is going to be lit. They did this in Brazil uh, a couple years ago, and then it was supposed to come here. Like, it's been supposing to come here for quite a while. Um, but they did this same thing in Brazil, and they, they sold out the stadium. And they had so many people waiting to get in that they rented out another stadium. And they had more people, even more people, so they rented out another location. And throughout this whole process of the send, um, I believe the president of Brazil gave his life to Jesus. That's nuts. Like, you're going to Brazil to equip and send people, and the leader of Brazil gives his life to Jesus. And if you do some research on it, um, I was really excited when all that was happening, and I kept up on it, and you would just see people on their face in the streets just worshiping Jesus. That's what heaven looks like right there. Just so powerful. I just can't, uh, we're taking, taking a youth group, we're taking a bunch of people out there. I'll be there, my kids will be there. I really encourage you guys to be there too. You guys will definitely be refreshed and ready to go. All right. So this message is called the gospel. And man, I love that word, the gospel. All right, so we're going to go Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to uh, break it down a little bit to the way I understand it. Um, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that is at the end of Matthew, and that is just like a kiss, like right on the end of it. It's like, okay, I gave you the gospel, here's Matthew, now what do I do with it? You've been commissioned. Like, come on, that is crazy to me. And I have it highlighted and underlined and underlined, purpose, purpose, purpose because God told me that this is my purpose. This is your purpose, this is your purpose, your purpose, your purpose, because it didn't just say in here, if you're an evangelist, um, go and preach the gospel, you know? It says, all authority has been given, now go, which is awesome to me, because what's the first two, two letters of the gospel is to go. And, um, When Jesus says to go, it's kind of like he's asking you to do something, right? Are we doing something? You know what I mean? Are we doing something? Because if Jesus is going to ask me to do something, I want to make sure that I'm doing it. Again, not because it's the right thing to do. Why? But because I love him. Jesus, I love you, and you told me to go. Now ask them where, ask them who, ask them how. Because some of us, I know when I first started out, and I was, he still am, but when I was first head over heels in love with Jesus and that overflow started to come, I didn't know what to do with it. And then my, my pastor said, why don't, you, why don't you go pray for somebody? And I was just like, okay, well, who should I pray for? I was like, well, I don't know. So when he said go pray for somebody, I thought he meant like, all right, now pick Rod, and then when you get home, you know, pray for him. God, I thank you for Rod. No, he's telling you to go, to go to that person and to pray for him. And I like the, uh, the vulnerability um, that you were showing too, where um, he just let us know something that uh, he struggles with, and it's actually something that we can help him with. You know, how hard would it be in two weeks from now or next week? Hey, brother, how you doing? You need any prayer? Can I pray for you? Is there any, is there any area in your life that I can maybe throw a quick hallelujah up for you? You know, we're brothers. We're sisters. We spur each other on. We sharpen each other. I get an opportunity to pray for him. You know what I mean? He just gave me permission. Normally I have to go and ask for it, but he gave it to me already. So I think that's super exciting. And something I found really great about this is um, in 19 it says 
therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Um, something that was really cool in there is the word, again, I'm going to stress it, is go. Um, he didn't say go and argue the gospel, did he? No. He said go and preach the gospel. Come on, man. That's too easy. So something that I have been taught from day one of being a Christian who goes out and goes is I refuse to argue with anybody about anything. So if I, and I've encountered this, I can't even tell you how many times that I've encountered this where you encounter somebody who, um, who and sometimes you'll encounter somebody that knows scripture better than you. You know what I mean? And the, the devil knows scripture. You know, he knows it front and back, and he can twist it and make it seem like whatever he wants it to be. So who am I to get into a conversation with somebody where the devil can have an opportunity to make not me look bad because it's not me, to make him look bad? And he can't look bad because he's not bad because there's no bad found in him. So if somebody wants to argue with me, I will never argue with you because my goal in a conversation with somebody is to make them feel more loved by me and by God, or else I don't want to be in that conversation. You know, I can't go and bring the love of the Father and what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this? Well, what about this? If I answered every question, all 10 of them, to your complete 100% satisfaction, would you surrender your life to Jesus? Almost 100% of the time, that answer is no. Okay. So I say, well, then I'm done here. I love you. He loves you. But I just don't think we're going to agree right now. So some people would view that as failure. But we are not soul winners. Okay. Get it through your head. We're not soul winners. There's nothing we can do to win a soul. We are seed planters. God decides when that happens. And if we get to be the one that's right there while they're giving their life to Jesus, praise God. Yes. What if it's somebody you've been pouring into for five years and then some random person at Walmart leads them to Jesus? What are we going to do? Praise Jesus. You're not going to feel bad that it's not yours. You know what I mean? Because in, in John... When, when, they were, when they were speaking to John the Baptist, this is what really helps me because, um, you know, I've discipled people and I've poured into them and I've prayed for them and all that kind of stuff. And then they plug into a different church and a different group and then meet somebody and they are living their life for the Lord. And the devil wants me to feel bad that I lost him or that it's, you know, oh man, I'm supposed to be enjoying that victory with him. But John said it the best. And it's like, there's a bride and there's a bridegroom and the bride is to be to the bridegroom and we are nothing but a friend. So who are we to stand in front of the bride and say, look how good I look today? Huh? What do you think? It's good day today, huh? Man, I hope I, uh, I, hope I, I sit down appropriately during the wedding and you know what I mean? It's like, why are we gonna take attention off of Jesus? If they're running for the Lord, man, just support them, love them, praise them, tell them good job. Um, and that was something that when I first started, I did like a control thing, you know. I don't need to be in control. I never am in control. And I've definitely learned that having six daughters and uh, a very, very independent wife that, uh, that sometimes when they say let go and let God, that's, that's probably what they were talking about. They were talking about that man that had six kids and... <laughs> and a wife that goes for it. So, you know, and there's, and there's something to be said, too. And um, I have some friends that are teachers. Um, and in my group, we're kind of focused on the, the not kind of focused, we're definitely focused on the fivefold. And, and we know which one we are and which, you know, like there's a test you can take. And, and I, I'm like evangelist and prophet and... Uh, I think pastoral is somewhere down the line, but uh, an evangelist isn't necessarily pastoral most of the time. But there's some, there's some teachers, which is the pinky finger, um, and us as, us, as, us as an evangelist like to give uh, crap to teachers, I guess. I don't, I'm one of my best friends as a teacher, and me and him butt heads so many times. 
and he, he's so great. Um, and then there's another guy in a group that he says that it's his mission to defend the gospel. And that just rubs me the wrong way. And we are, we are brothers, and then, you know, and then he is just so good at it too. And he's just like so good at apologetics and everything. And um, then I found out apologetics is defending the religion or whatever, but um, I really don't have to defend my relationship. You know, I don't have to defend my relationship with anybody. You know, you defend religion, but you can't defend relationship because relationship is completely different. I don't have to defend my relationship with my daughters. They know I love them. They know I'm a good dad. They know I care about them. They know that I get angry sometimes. But they know that I have nothing but good intentions for them. And they know that I want to see them safe. And I want to keep them. And I want to hold them. And I want to make sure nobody can do anything that would influence them in the wrong direction. God, Jesus, you're so worthy and you're so good. So if we are... Um, so if we were to go, right, um, I just want to see, like, where the base is. Like, do we have people here that, um, that pray for people every week? Uh, stranger, you know, you see somebody at Walmart. Hey, you, come over here. Can I tell you something real quick? Jesus loves you so much, okay? Um, and that's not very, is that comfortable, right? Does that, how does that make you feel? Does it feel like that weird cheese feeling in your stomach when, I have to go talk to a stranger? What? <laughs> no, thank you. I'm good. I'm just sitting in my truck. I don't want to get out and do that. Uh, uh, hello? I'm, I'm busy. You, you can find anything, any excuse. I feel the same way, guys. I'm telling you 100% right now that when God tells me to go pray for somebody, sometimes I just want to sit in my truck. I don't want to get up. I don't want to turn around. I don't want to go do that. But wait a minute. I love you. Of course I will. You know, because that's you just, you just want to be squeezed. That cheese feeling, that feeling you get is the devil. It's him telling you, you don't want to do that. What if you look stupid? What if you don't know what to say? What if you don't say anything? What if they yell at you? What if they spit on you? Guess what? That all happened to Jesus, you know? So what I really, really focus on is when I do feel that squeeze, when I do feel that cheese, I know that, I know who's doing that to me. And guess what? He doesn't do that for very long once he finds out that you know that that's him. He won't squeeze you anymore. And then pretty soon, like for me, it's like an inconvenience or something, you know, like I'm really busy, I have my family, I have this and I have that, and then God goes, well, what's important, you know? Yes, Lord. To see one more come. To see one more ushered into your kingdom. To see one more person who didn't know about you realize that there is a man named Jesus and he is alive and he is real and he gave his life for you. Yes, I will get out of my church. Doesn't it seem so easy now? There are people dying every single day. Sometimes it, like, I view them as like walking corpses, really. Um, because there's no, there's no joy, there's no peace, there's nothing but anxiety and worry, strife and pain and turmoil. But most of all, there's no rest. As many people as I've encountered, the rest and the peace is what hits them first. Because the devil is just there accusing, 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 accusing. You're stupid, you're unworthy, you're dirty, you can't do this. You'll never be there financially. Remember that thought you had last week? Remember that thing you did? Remember that, remember that thing you watched? You know, he, constantly he's doing it. And when is enough enough? Like if, if you have Jesus, when is enough enough? When are you going to tell the devil to stop? You know? So if you're not as comfortable reaching out with somebody, I want to give you guys some practical things that I do when he tells me to go. So... Restaurants are very, very easy. How many people here go out to eat? Yay, quite a few. So it starts with that waitress, you know what I mean? We are so fortunate that we have this random person to come and serve us. Sure, they're getting paid, but the heart of a person in the service industry, I have humongous heart for them. I'm gonna choose to serve you, you know what I mean? That just means something to me. 
Like when my wife makes me food, she's serving me. I love it. And I love food too. Um, but with, with your waitress, it's just something as simple as being normal, okay? How are you? Are you good? I'm well. Thank you. You order your food. You know, and it starts with, what's your name? You know, start to build some rapport with them instead of, um, what do you want to drink? Okay, I'll be back. What do you want to eat? That's it. And don't only have that conversation with them. Hey, you from around here? How long have you worked here? Hey, you have any kids? I got, I got six myself. You know, hey, what's good here? Do you eat here a lot? You know, start to ask questions about it because people love to talk about themselves. They absolutely do. And in talking about themselves, you can glean a little information. You can, by being intentional with somebody like that, um, I have gotten more words from God just by asking them where they're from how many kids they have. Do you enjoy your job? And it's not prying for information, but it's, it's actually just caring. Because when I take a step out and I cross that line and I go and I start to care, God starts to speak to me about them. And he will speak to you about them as well. And 100% he will, okay? And something that's really easy to do is when your food comes... I don't know about you guys, but we pray for our food before we eat it. How hard is it to ask your waitress, hey, we're going we're gonna to bless our food. Um, do you want to join us? A lot of the time they say yes. And it's so cool that you just get to, to do that with them. You know, you get to represent Jesus. And sure, it's just a, a prayer over some food, but it's bold. It's out in public. Some people view that as uncomfortable. Normally when you get your food, it could just be, God, thank you for this food, Jesus' name, amen. No, God, I just thank you right now in this restaurant that you gave us a waitress that has a heart for you that will serve. Obviously, bless your food and pray for her after, but um, that's, a, that's a really good way to open the door, let her, let her see that like what you guys are flowing in and it's not as awkward. And when it comes time for the end of your food, it's super duper easy. Now that you have built this relationship with them, hey, what can I pray for you for? Is there anything I can pray for you? Oh, no, I'm good. Are you sure? What, what is, and you'll, you'll get, no, I'm good right away. And it says, no, 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 no. Surely everything's not good. You know, what is, okay, well, even if everything is good, what is one thing that you're believing for, you know? What if there was a miracle that could happen and then you would know that Jesus is absolutely real? What would that be? Well, if my grandma didn't have cancer, cool, let's go. Father, I thank you right now that you didn't make her grandma to have cancer. Build that faith, bolster it. Wait for that report. And please tip them. <laughs> tip them. Give them money. What good are we if we tell them about Jesus and don't bless them? I mean, we go as far as to tip the bill, okay? That's what uh, I learned Todd White was saying. He said, I don't go out to eat unless I can tip the bill. So my bill's $59. Go ahead and tip $59. Who's God's will, God's bill, right? And most waitresses, from my experience, hate Sundays because all the stingy, complaining church people come in, complain, and don't tip, Okay? Oh, I gave all my money to the tithe. I don't know. I don't really have enough to give out on the other end of it. Pull out your wallet and throw a 20 down there. Don't do your math. What's 10% of nothing? Just throw a 20, 25 out there. Watch, watch it work. And this reminds me of a story. Um, I've talked about you guys, Reinhard Bonnke. He's a really big role model for me. Just a fire-breathing German evangelist who is now dancing with Jesus. Over 110 million decisions for Christ. I was watching an old YouTube video, and they were saying back then it was like 8,000 people a day came to the Lord, if you uh, divide the numbers out from the ministry. But this is something that's really cool, too. What if you're hanging out? What if you go to um, an area where you know everybody there? You know, you know that everybody's saved or something like that. And this is a good example of you never, like you never know where you are or what God's doing. Um, all Reinhardt knew is that he had to be obedient, and he did. Um, so he's preaching at a pastor's conference, and there's probably 250 people in the room. 
and he's Reinhard Bonnke. He has a really big ministry, and everybody who's at this pastor's dinner is somebody. They have a church. They have a they have a ministry, they have a setup, you know, they're, they're Christians that are living their life for the Lord and they're good. So during this breakfast, he goes, oh, I just feel like I should preach the gospel. And everybody's kind of looking at each other like, we're all pastors here, bud. Like, I don't know what kind of, what kind of deal is going to go on. So he starts preaching the gospel, the un, unfiltered gospel. And he just lays it out for everybody in that room right there at this hotel. And he says, okay, everybody, it comes time for the altar call now, right? So he says, everybody bow your heads down, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see who wants to receive Jesus. So he starts, he starts saying it, you know, if you want to give your life to Jesus, you need to come forward, and you need to come down here, and we'll pray for you. And mind you, we're at a pastor's conference. And by the time that those pastors open their eyes, every single wait staff that was at that room on their face. Come on. Who would think to preach the gospel at a pastor's event? You know what I mean? And what are there? There's people that are serving you. And these people that were serving got so taken by the gospel that they gave their life to Jesus. And I think that's just a really, really good story on when do you preach the gospel? When do you minister to people? Always. Always listen to the Lord. Preach the gospel now. There's a bunch of pastors here. There's a hundred of them. You know, you think he felt like he was going to look stupid or whatever. But you don't feel that anymore when you're, when you're doing what God tells you to do. Because so many times he's told me to do things and I've done them. And I am so excited I have. Because he, he, he will not return void. He won't. Not a day in his life. Not a day in your life. Not a day in forever. So something I wanted to uh, touch base on, too, it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So discipleship is super duper key. And uh, my first message I, I preached on, I, I am a product of discipleship. Somebody was there to pour into me, to love me, to guide me. Obviously, it was Jesus, but I also had a person too that was investing in me and keeping me accountable and saying how's your heart how's this how's that and as an evangelist you'll you'll pray for somebody they'll accept Jesus and you'll go on to the next one or whatever but we need to have and as an evangelist I think you have a responsibility to have a church that you're you're plugged into or have a network of churches that you can plug somebody into because if the the public touch doesn't turn into a private kiss, then they're going to fade away. The relationship is, is going to wean unless they're plugged in and they can be sharpened by your brothers and sisters. And I was having such a hard time this week. But I'm not like the chaff, though. That's what's so exciting because I'm still here and I won't blow away. And every time I got attacked by the devil, I just said, well, maybe I just won't preach anymore. You know? Can you believe I said those words? It, like in my head. And I was just like, you dirty dog. I can't believe that I'm thinking those kind of thoughts. <laughs> but what's really cool is like uh, when, you, when you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice, right? When you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. So what happens when you sque squeeze a Christian? You're supposed to give him Jesus, right? I should be so full of Jesus that when the devil squeezes me, Jesus comes out. Not, I don't think I should preach again. He should squeeze me, and I say, praise God, I can't wait to preach again. God, I thank you for protecting my family. So, disciples, super important, okay? And um, I have another message that I'll give, if I've given the opportunity, on um, what, what I do practically on discipleship making and how it can be practically used. <laughs> Um, but what I want to focus on is the part that says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. When he says all nations, um, obviously all of us, I don't know about obviously, but for me, when I first read it, I thought Africa, uh, Australia, Ukraine, Russia, like I thought of all these things. But what really, really hit home for me on all nations is most of us aren't leaving this state this week or this month or the next five months. 
So for me, my nation is right here. It's what I'm doing here, it's where I'm going, and it's who I see. So if he says all, who am I to exclude anybody that I see? Okay? And I used to shy away from certain kind of people. Okay? Um, and God's really broke me absolutely free and clear of this, which is super awesome. Um, but like homosexuals, I would just kind of, you know, somebody will minister there. You know, somebody will, somebody will get there. Who's the somebody? <laughs> me. If not you, then who, right? And if God put them in front of you and you're at Walmart or you're at the gas station and that person's standing in front of you, who are you not to give them Jesus still, you know? And I think, uh, I think homosexuals just have a really big attack on them, especially nowadays with all the, um, the gender and um, it's okay and all this kind of stuff. And where we're at now as a nation, I think that they need to be poured into even more. And some of us have our opinions on it, you know? And that's really funny because those are your opinions. That's not what God feels about that person, you know? He doesn't see a homosexual he doesn't see the way they're dressed. He doesn't see the way they talk. And when I, and what's really funny is I used to, before I um, gave my heart to the Lord, I used to live with these um, two homosexual guys, and they were my best friends. So there wasn't anybody in the world that I got along more with than these two. Um, and through living with them for a while, I got to hear like the inner struggles of somebody that um, is tra attracted to somebody of the same sex. And let me tell you, most of them are torn up about it, okay? They say, do you think this is something I wanted to choose? And do you think that I wanted to be part of this, um, this population, this number? You think that I like it that my parents don't like me? You like it that the government doesn't recognize my relationship? You think I like all that kind of stuff? So there is a lot of people out there that are hurting. And we get an opportunity to bring Jesus to them. And what's really cool is I run into somebody like this, and I'm not afraid anymore to come right up to them and start a dialogue with them and a conversation with them because I know who I am and I know who they are. And when I get into a conversation with somebody that is a homosexual, it's sometimes very aggressive. And like I said, I don't argue. But what I like to start out saying is God loves homosexuals. Okay? He doesn't like what you're doing. You, just like, okay, if that was pretty heavy when I said it, okay? Um, but does, does God love somebody that looks at pornography? I still think he does, right? Does God love an alcoholic? I think he does, right? So why is it such a big difference between the word homosexual and alcoholic or homosexual and somebody who looks at porn, okay? Sin is sin regardless. So why are they any different than the guy who is a trucker? Why do we view him differently? Why do we step around it differently? Why do we do everything differently? Because they're homosexual, okay? So when it says all nations, are you guys going to pick and choose who you minister to? You know what I mean? I just want to get it really clear that, that God doesn't see those kind of things. He doesn't. And he loves them just the same. So when I minister to somebody, and I, I really make it clear that, oh, the church doesn't like me, and all this and that, they won't let me in there, and all this. It's like, well, is that any different than the person that was at the bar on Saturday? Do you think you're any different than that? God doesn't see that. God sees your heart. God loves you, and he is here for you. So if anybody, I don't, I don't know if anybody, if that hit home for anybody, or if it was probably kind of weird for you guys that this guy's up here talking about homosexuality, and God loves him, and stuff like that. But he loves him just as much as he loves me, even though I'm his favorite. I know, I know, I'm just kidding. But I am beloved. Me and my friends always joke that we're his favorite and when you open up when he opens up his cell phone, I'm the I'm the screen on the on the save screen. 
when he, when he opens up his wallet, all the pictures of my family come spilling out. Because really, that's the way he feels about me and my family. He goes, there's Jesse. I love him. I love his heart. I love his family. I love who he is. I love who I made him to be. Thank you, Jesus. All right, I'm going to transition um, into Matthew 10, 8. So once I started to, once I started to go... Right, he said, "Go and make disciples. Go, go preach the gospel. Go into all nations." Um, I started to encounter people that were sick. You know, what about cancer? Can God do anything for that? Let's see, Matthew ten seven. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy cast out demons, give as freely as you have received. And when I read this, I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Let me check again. Yep, red letters. Jesus said those. When I get them red letters, I really hold on to them, and I really go after them. They're super duper important. So you're meaning to tell me, he said, heal the sick. Can I do that? He can do that through me, I think is really super special. But what I, what I focused on first, it says, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, and I was discussing this with my wife earlier. Um, when they say near in there, um, is that like a time frame? Like, oh, that man is near, so he'll be here soon. Or is it a logistical word, okay? I'm pretty sure it's logistical because the kingdom of heaven is inside me. I am the righteousness of Christ. He has given me his fullness. Therefore, if you go up to somebody and, hey, bud, hey, did you know that the kingdom of heaven is near? He's going to be like, what? What do you mean? Let me tell you. Come here. Let me show you. Do you, have any, do you have anything you need prayer for? Because the kingdom of heaven is here because I am co-heir in Christ. What a wonderful opportunity. And that is the only reason that we have that access as well. So when it says heal the sick, that would mean that we have an opportunity to do that or even the ability to do that. Raise the dead. Okay, I'm for it. All right. I think that's a possibility. In fact, I know it's a possibility. Uh, there's a guy, David Hogan, has a wonderful ministry. Dead raised all the time. You guys ever heard of Heidi Baker? It's a normal thing in that ministry. It wouldn't be so radical reading it in the Bible if you've seen the dead raised. And like, I have, I don't even know, countless testimonies of people getting healed, even, even this week. And I've had, you know, people say, well, how can I see that in my life? And I love this. We'll just go through a little diagnostic right here. Okay, how can you see this in your life? How many sick people have you prayed for? Well, none. There we go. That's how we work on it. Go pray for them, you know. And um, I've ran into people that were like, you don't even understand. I've prayed for like 10 people and nobody got healed. And I say, sweet, pray for the 11th person like all 10 got healed. Because we're not about discouragement here. We're not about beating ourselves up. And how do we see success? Because if you, if you try to see success on whether or not they got healed, we're just missing it, okay? Just go and pray for them. Let God take care of the rest. Just like I said, we're not soul winners. We're seed planters, Okay? Bolster that faith. Raise that faith. Pray for that person. You want to see the dead raised? How many dead people have you prayed for? I love my wife so much. Uh, she freaked me out a whole bunch when I got together with her because she wanted to see the dead raised. Wow, are you serious? Now I find that super, super duper attractive. My wife is reading the Bible and she's going after God's heart. 
But yeah, how many dead people have you prayed for? Because it says you can raise the dead. It's right there. Then we pass over the leprosy thing, right? That hasn't been, been around for a while, unless somebody goes and eats an armadillo. I heard that that's possible. <laughs> Don't eat an armadillo. You can just start leprosy all over again. Cast out demons. That's a weird one, right? People tend to shy away from that. Dude, demons scary. Don't want to get anything. I can't get it. <laughs> it can't attach itself to me. It's impossible. I can certainly cast it out. I can certainly tell it to go. I can certainly look you in the eyes and tell that thing to leave, and it has to. Why? Because I've been given the authority. The ground I walk on is holy ground. The ground you walk on is holy ground. Everywhere we go, they can't be. You can't be in my house, for as me and my house are concerned, we serve the Lord, so you have to leave. The second that we feel any disrupt disruptance in our household, we pray. They have to go, and it, they can't stay. And if you're dealing with a lot of oppression and stuff like that, tell it to go, because it's set up dominion in you. That's not theirs. It's not their place. It's like... Yeah, it's like I come home and they're sitting on my couch or something. Like, you're not supposed to be here. Get up, stranger, and leave. You know, it's just, just like that. So if you're dealing with, with thoughts that, like, I'm just getting, like, impure thoughts. Like, if you're dealing with that, that is not you. That is not you. Cast it out and tell it to go. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am holy just as he is holy. I see what he sees. I say what he says. You cannot be here. Go. And if you need any prayer for that, please, 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 please come. Come, come, come. Because why? He's the God of miracles. Okay? The lady Heidi Baker, I was talking about her. She has Iris... Iris can't really say Iris Ministries, I-R-I-S, I believe. Um, and she, if you guys do any research on somebody, she is a really, really good one. She's in Mozambique. Um, she's in the mud. Um, she's this nice, pretty, blonde, white lady who is just surrounded by Africans. And she is in her element. And it is amazing. They've seen dead rays healings, tons of decisions for Christ, and she doesn't just go there and leave. She is Mozambique, and I love it. I love her heart. Um, and something that she does that I think is super impactful, and it just blows my mind, she will go into a new village, and she will stand there, and she'll say, bring me your deaf. There was one time there was this deaf woman. Uh, specifically, God showed her a deaf woman, and she said, bring me this deaf woman, and nobody came forward, nobody came forward. So she stood there for 20 minutes, still calling this deaf woman. And she says, I will not preach until she is here. And if she didn't come, she would have left because she's obedient to the Lord. So after 20 minutes of calling this deaf woman, people realize that she's probably deaf and can't hear her. So they went, they went and got this deaf woman in the village and they brought her forward. And I love this so, so, so much. It's so cool, it's so bold, and it makes me just wanna jump up and down and go pray for people. She goes, do you know this woman? Everybody goes, yes. Is she deaf? Yes. So you know this woman to be deaf? Yes. She can't hear anything. Yes, it just really drives it home. Okay, so you know this woman, and she's deaf. Boom, prays for her. Ears open in Jesus' name. I mean, I'm talking 90-something percent success rate in doing this. And what's really, really awesome is she demonstrates the power of the gospel. These people all know she's deaf. All of them. It's, 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 you know, it's a, a village. There's not that big. There's not many more places to go. 
I know that lady, she's been deaf my whole life, and now she can hear. That is the power of the gospel. So she demonstrates the power, and then she preaches the Jesus that that power came from. And you can do it either way. You can preach the, the Jesus and then demonstrate the power, and it's still going to be successful. But how crazy to have that whole village, bink, just have a revelation of Christ right there. I know her. I know she can't hear. And now she does. So who, who is your people? And this isn't, this isn't a super long message. I'm almost done. Um, but I just wanted to, one, point at Jesus, and two, encourage you. Um, when we leave here, I want you to feel more encouraged to go talk to a stranger than you were when you walked into this building. And I think if that happens, there is a success going on in this church. If we can be a church that is not afraid when we leave this building to bring Jesus. Like I said, if we are to be married to Christ and we have a marriage covenant with him, what does that look like? I only love you on Sunday from 10 to noon, and that's it. No, I love you today, I love you tomorrow, I love you when I go to the gas station, I love you when I go to Walmart, I love you when I go to the hardware store, I love you when I'm on the construction site, I love you when I'm in a tough meeting with a contractor who just doesn't get what a schedule looks like. I love you when this person can't understand what I'm saying, you know? But who are your people? And like I was talking about with homosexuals, that's everybody's people, guys. Reach out to anybody and everybody that you can. And I really want to encourage you guys. I have uh, uh, three testimonies to share before I'm done. And I think they're all super great because God is super good. Um, so this week I was feeling really attacked and just un, like not, not necessarily unworthy, but it was just like, man, it just sucks. I just like going through my week and everything's easy and I'm not getting pressed and pushed and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what I did is I called my brothers and my sisters and I said, hey, pray for me, man. I'm really going through a time right now. Uh, I am. And I just want you guys to pray for me. Boom, fire in that vehicle. I can tell you it fell. And then after that, I had to call another friend just because I was so excited and I wanted to spur them on. But as I'm having this, this time, and um, I'm having a difficult time at work too, we just got several projects going on and I'm a project manager and sometimes a lot of responsibility follow, falls that way. Um, even when it's not your fault, it's always your fault. But praise God that he made me who I am and I can handle those things. Um, but I'm sitting there and I just got out of a meeting that I didn't necessarily care to be in and I go into the gas station, and for some reason, I love Casey's, and I am a really big hamburger guy. If you ask any one of my friends what I'm going to eat, it's going to be a hamburger. And for some reason, I like Casey's hamburgers. They're fake hamburgers, but dang, they taste so good and fake. <laughs> I'm just like, anytime. Anytime you want to give me a hamburger, I'm it. I'm for it. I'm going it. So I'm standing there. I got my hamburger. My day's looking a little better. And there's this, uh, there's this tall guy, and uh, I'm standing here, and I'm going to be polite and let him walk in front of me, and he's just staring past me. And I'm staring at him, and he's staring past me, and I'm like, all right, I guess I'll move first. And I go, and he walks past me like I don't even exist, and I'm like, how hard would it have been to have been like, hey, bud, you coming this way? You going this way? I'm going that way? Okay, cool. No, he just like looked past me, so it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I was like, rude. How hard is it just to say something, you know? I want to go, I'm going the same way you are, bud. Like, you know, I was just super frustrated, you know? And I'm just like, I go and I grab my water and I really want to get a Coke, but I'm not because caffeine just has a hold of me. <laughs> it's just not a good thing for me. So I make a good decision and I get a water. And um, I get in line and this guy just like limping away. And then I notice he has a limp and I'm like, oh man. This guy's limping. That's pretty cool. But, man, I'm mad at him, you know? <laughs> Freaking, you would have got your prayer if he didn't, you know, got that eye contact. We would have been, could have made stuff happen, but no. So I'm standing there still in my bad mood. Still bad mood, Jesse. Just poor Jesse. Oh, poor Jesse. And um, I about dropped my sandwich, and the lady behind the counter can't figure it out. This lady can't figure it out. And then they start talking to each other, and... I'm just really not having a good time in this gas station. And I about dropped my sandwich, and I, uh, I just catch it. 
And then the voice behind me goes, ha, nice. <laughs> and it's the same guy that I got a problem with that I think has a problem with me. He's standing directly behind me. It's cool. And then I just thought about it, and I'm, he, you know, he was like, <laughs> like nice. Like, he was like, good catch, bro. And, and I'm like, I softened my heart. You know what I mean? I was just like, oh, thanks, man. It was a good catch. Just, woo, got it. Um, but that really just, what is my deal? You know what I mean? What is my deal? I'm mad at who, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass this guy up just because he stared past me? Who do I think? You know, that's, that's the way I thought about myself in that scenario. The Christ in me wasn't bigger than what I was going through at that moment, even though it was a super small thing. But we all go through those things all the time. So I pay... I think about paying for his, too. Uh, it's just a fun thing to do because he just had, like, a pizza and a fountain drink, and it was, hey, add those on. Boom. Do it. Please, guys, do it. At a gas station, somebody's behind you, I'll get theirs, too. You do not know how many times that's opened up a door to share the gospel. Why'd you do that? Why not? Do you do that? You don't do that? Why don't you? It's fun. It's easy. Pull out your debit card. Slide it in. Bless them. Freely give. Right at the bottom. Give as freely as you received. Everything I have received has been free 99. The best price in the whole world is free 99. You can't beat it. It has been given to me. I will give it out immediately. So I pay for my food. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know that I know that I know that I need to pray for this guy. Okay? But we like to do stuff with God, right? We like to be like, well, you're right, but I'm going to go sit in my car, and if this is truly you, Lord, you will send him by my vehicle. So I sit down, and mind you, I'm parked in an, um, in an obscure part of Casey's in Cameron, Missouri, and I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting and I don't see him, so maybe I missed him. Maybe he parked over here and he came out and snuck away. So, do 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 do. Started on my truck, hit it in reverse. Said, God, send him somebody. Boop. Just about hit the freaking guy trying to back out of my spot. <laughs> here he is, limping away. <sighs> okay, Lord. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Why did I do this? So I put it in park, poof, I get out. Hey, brother, hey, man. And he can't get away too fast because he's limping, right? <laughs> so I know that I'm going to beat him to his car because he's almost there. Boom, boom, boom. Hey, man, uh, what, happened, what happened to your hip? And this is really funny because this happens a lot too. And if somebody asked me what happened to my hip, I'd be like, why? You know? But he just went into his story. But it was funny because his story included the F word like every... Every third word, when I hip this and half and that and half and that and half and that and half and that, do you think that stopped me? Do you think that made me approach this conversation any differently? Heck no, man. So I said, hey, bud, this might sound crazy, but I don't think your hip was supposed to be hurt that way. And he's like, okay. <laughs> well, do you want it to keep hurting? It's like, of course not. Okay, well, can I pray for you? What? I was like, you ever heard of that? What? I was like, yeah, man, it's cool, it's easy. I love Jesus, and Jesus loves you so much. I'm just going to put my hand right here. You can put your hand here, too. I'll put my hand on you. I can put my hand on your shoulder. I really don't want to like go into arguments here. But I just want to pray for you in Jesus' name, and then your hip will not hurt. What? It's like, okay, does... Is English a problem here, or? No, okay, I didn't think it was. All right, good. Okay, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, and he loves you. And he says in the Bible to heal the sick. Do you mind if I try that out? Sure. Put my hand on him. Say a really quick prayer. Father God, I thank you in the name of Jesus that he is not made to be hurt, that his hip isn't hurt. Thank you, God, that he's going to be healed right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And he goes, 
<laughs> thanks, bro. And I'm like, no, check it out. Check it out. See if it's better. And he's, well, it does feel a little better. Thanks, man. And I go, okay, cool. Well, my God isn't a God of a little better. You know, my God is a God of all the way. Let me pray again. Let me pray one more time, and then I'll leave you alone. Father God, I thank you for a little bit. I ask you for all the way. In Jesus' name. This dude didn't know what was going on. Like, he was like, I, I, I don't know. It's so hard to explain, but I see it all the time. When somebody gets healed, there's this, there's this movie reel that's playing in their head that is just unbelievable. And I go, you feel that? You feel that? Yeah. It's Jesus, man. Really? It's like, he loves you so much. I was like, you have a good day, okay? He said, okay. And he got in his car and he left. You know? That was my job, you know? I didn't have to do anything different than what God told me to do. And uh, it's really cool. I was pulling away, and he puts his stuff on the top of his car. And he's just staring at me. <laughs> Gets in his car like this, you know what I mean? As soon as he rift, lifted his leg to get in that car, I always started crying. Praise God that that guy is healed. Sometimes they lie to you. I, I tell them all that all the time. Don't lie to me. Don't be nice. Don't be nice. I'm serious. If it's not healed, tell me. I don't like nice people. I like the people who tell the truth. Those ones are the best. So that was really super fun. And that was all directly out of just seeing this guy. And I just want to give you guys some practical testimonies on how this happened and how this can happen in your life. Because I am no different than you. I can tell you that right now. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same God speaking the same things. Listen to him. Be bold. Step out and just say something. You know how hard it was when I first started? Do you know how smooth I was when I first started? Hi, hi um, eh, hey, um, Jesus loves you. And then we, you know? God still loves that. He loves it. 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 And he kisses it. Because what he does is he sees your heart. Just like when I play cajon. I'm definitely not very good at cajon, but he doesn't hear my notes. He hears my heart. And he knows that I'm there because it needs to be played. And that I want to worship to the Lord. And I want to make a, I was going to say a beautiful sound, but just a sound. I want to make a sound for the Lord. But he sees your heart. Just like when you minister to somebody. Man, there's some times when I get done and I just feel embarrassed. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, man, did I really say all that stuff? Gee whiz. So, man. But he doesn't see that in you, you know? He sees, that's my boy. That's my guy. That's my girl. He, they're doing it. They're walking this thing out. They're reading this Bible. Okay, it says go. I'm going to go. It says heal. I'm going to heal. And he loves it. So after that, I, uh, the next day, I'm in Holden, and there's the, the Lyric House, and it's really super fun that so much ministry comes into that place in Holden. I mean, we just got people coming in, coming out, and it's just like we get a chance to just speak with them. And it's easier because my friends own the coffee shop. So that makes it a little more of a safe place to minister. But what's really cool is your dad owns that gas station. Your dad owns that Walmart. Your dad owns the places that you go because he is God and he is good and everything is his and he made it yours. So what, as comfortable as I feel ministering here, as comfortable as I feel ministering at the Lyric House, you, I should feel just as comfortable ministering in Walmart than I do in a church. Because everywhere I step is holy ground, and everywhere I step, he's with me, and everywhere I step, I'm only doing what he told me to do. I'm only saying what he told me to say. So there's a, this one was kind of easier. They were, they, were, they were hip to God, you know. They were, they were in YWAM, um, so they are privy to the things of God. And they, we saw him, we started talking to him, started loving him. Um, my buddy Jason was talking to him first. And then he said, come in here. We have a conference room that me and my buddy work in uh, just so we can kind of keep on task. Um, but he says, come in here. Uh, Jesse and Austin, they're in here. Um, we'll, bring the fire, we'll bring the fire together. And I hear this in the other room, and I'm like, oh, yeah, because this is my boss talking. That's our leader. 
I don't really like to call him a boss. I tried to start calling him a leader from now on because I think boss is just too much of a too much of a bad term. I don't know. I like leader better. So he was our leader. Uh, he, and as soon as I heard that, I got really excited because I knew I was going to get to pray. So I shut my laptop. I put it away. And I pull out my Bible. And he comes in, and his shoulder hurts really bad. Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure about really bad, but um, his shoulder hurts. And he says he needs healing in his shoulder. Guys, what are we going to do? We're going to pray. Boom. We pray for this guy. Long story short, short story long completely healed like come on we get to do that and it wasn't some uh long drawn out thing like with me and the guy in the gas station and a big story but it was a hey my shoulder hurts brother sweet let's pray jesus name this has to go has to be released and i i feel that breakthrough coming for this church and it already has okay and it's breaking through, and it's breaking through, and it's breaking through, and the devil's trying to close the door. He's trying to put those, I see us kicking through a wall, boom, and there's all these pieces, and the devil's just trying to put these pieces back together to form that wall so that we can just sit where we were sitting. But we're not sitting there anymore because it's time to remodel. We're time to, we're time to break down these walls, and we're time to expand our space and expand the anointing, just do more God said, you, Jesus said, you will do these things and greater. And when he was saying greater, in my mind, that means that Jesus was one man and he had 12 disciples. How many people do we have in this room? We have a greater number than that. So we will do greater things. Because what can you do greater than Jesus did? I mean, you really, can you raise the dead any better? I don't know. But um, for me, that greater means in a greater quantity. And we have this quantity here. We need to just go after it. Man, I don't feel good today. One of our uh, masons, no siento bien, means I don't feel good. Sweet. Uh, orar, which means pray. I pray. I have a lot of uh, Hispanic people on our crew, so I started to, years back, I started to learn a lot of Spanish phrases just for praying. Like, enseñame donde, like, show me, show me where. You know, dolor is pain. And send you my donde, the Lord. Aquí? Okay. Orar. We'll pray. They don't have to understand it. Spiritu Santos. Easy. Where's your group? Where's your people? I can't speak Spanish, <laughs> even though I married a Hispanic woman. <laughs> I can definitely understand Spanish, though. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's definitely a very important part. So, who's your people, you know? Everybody's your people, obviously, if you've heard anything from this message. It doesn't matter who they are. But just, I, like, as an evangelist, I just get so pumped up, and I'm just like, how do people not see this? And I just want to, I could, like, break this microphone with how hard I want to grip it, just so how excited I am that when I preach this message, people are going to go and do it. It's just, yes, go love somebody. So I'm going to wrap up with this. Um, my grandma called me about two weeks ago. And she says, Jesse, add me to your prayer list. And I said, and I was, and she said, pray for me later. And I called my grandma, and I was like, well, that's not going to do because I don't hold my list for long. Like, there's no really list. Like, you want me to pray? I pray right now, Grandma. You know that. Okay. Um, well, I got a tumor. I said, okay. Well, not for long, and I don't agree with it. So, where at? And she says, well, it's on the left side of my my head start to impede my hearing, so I need to go and get it checked out. Um, it's pretty big. I said, okay. Grandma, we're going to pray right now. And when I'm done praying, you're going to go to the doctor, and they're not going to find a single bit of trace of what you're looking for. There will be no tumor there, because I do not agree with that in Jesus' name. I don't care what the two doctors that you went to said, This one's finding nothing, and they will continue to find nothing, Grandma. So, Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name that this tumor is no longer existent, and it does not have a hold on her ear canal, and it does not have a place in her head. It is gone now in Jesus' name. Wouldn't you know it? What happened? Went to the doctor. No tumor. Come on. I didn't even touch her. I was on a phone call. If you can, lay hands. If you can't, still pray. 
I wasn't there, but God was. And I like to say I wasn't there, but my spirit was there. Nothing is impossible. A phone call, my friends, come on. We serve a powerful God. And what's really fun is that if you look at other religions, like Muslim and all that kind of stuff, they set the table for their God, and their God eats it. God sets the table for us, and we eat it with him. In those other religions, they serve a dead idol that doesn't speak to them. (laughs) We serve a living God that does nothing but talk to me, who does nothing but want to be with me. When I sit down, he's right next to me. When I stand up and minister, he's right here with me. When I say, hey, buddy, what happened to your hip? He's right there with me. I will never fail if I do what he tells me to do because he will see my heart He will see that person, and there's no pressure on me because it is him. So as I said, I'd I'd always want to point to him. So when you, when, listen, when you pray for somebody, when they get healed, you will point to him. Always will point to him. When you give a word for somebody, And it is so spot on that you called out their birthday and everything. Who are you going to point? You're so awesome. I can't believe you know that. Oh, man. No, 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 no. It's him. It's always been him. It always will be him. I am nothing unless he comes here. And I also want to encourage you guys. I got got one more. I got time for one more, Rod. Um, I I flew down here. Uh, I just was reminded of this testimony. This is such a wonderful testimony. It's one of my favorite testimonies. Um... I flew down here, I used to live in South Dakota, and I'd fly down here uh, quite often to come visit my friends uh, that, that, that live here, it's who I'm with now. Then I was flying down here and there was a miscommunication. I sent them my plane tickets and they were gonna pick me up in Kansas City and they were accidentally looking at my layover and not my final destination. So they decided, we're gonna go home, but we're gonna get you an Uber. It's like, ah, oh, great. Good. I mean, from Kansas City to Holden, Missouri, I'm going to be sitting in an Uber. They can't go nowhere. They are, they are trapped with me. <laughs> I'm so excited. Same thing with airplanes. So I get there. They're, they're all stuck there with me, which I think is super great. You just get a chance to love them, and they can't go anywhere. So in my experience, an Uber driver taking me all the way over there, his name was Nabil. Super, super nice guy. He opens up the back door for me. He says, hello, I'm Nabil. I'll take you to your destination. I said, that's great, Nabil. Do you mind if I sit in the front seat? He's like, oh, but the back seat, it's nice and comfortable, lots of space. He's like, no, it's fine. I'm all right, sit in the front. That's one. I'm kind of lonely, man. I want to chat. You want to chat? Oh, sure. So we get in there, and I almost know immediately that this man knows that I'm a Christian. And he goes, um, he goes, Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Praise God. I, uh, I've been waiting all night. I just need, I need money. And this one, one, I just needed one. And this is a pretty big ride for him. You know, I mean, it, normally they're like airport here, airport here, airport here. But this is going to take up his whole night. This is like two hours. So like the, just the, the cost of it alone was like a hundred and something dollars. So to this guy, it was, it was fulfilling what he was praying for. And I was, he was like, oh, praise God, I was, I, was, I was praying for just one big ride, and that was it, and, I, and that's you, and praise God. And I'm like, cool, man, praise God. I was like, I'm a minister too. I love Jesus. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 I know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I was like, what about you? I was like, Muslim? Oh, yeah, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. But listen, man. I don't want no bad review. I don't want no bad review. Okay? I mean, you love Jesus. I think Jesus was an awesome guy. Let's leave it at that. And I says, well, sir, I can't just leave it at that. And, I was, and you guys know what I say. I'm not going to argue with you. And I told Nabil that, too. I won't argue with you, Nabil. Don't worry. Okay. I was like, can we talk about it? And he says, sure. But we're not going to argue? Nope, not going to argue. Okay. 
So we start talking, and in a Muslim culture, they believe, and it's so convincing to them, you know, they believe that Jesus is a real person, but he didn't do what we say that he really did. So he was a cool guy, and he was a cool prophet, and he did really great things, but he just wasn't the savior of mankind. Spit in Jesus' face, will you? Golly, this poof just put some fire inside me that I'm like, not today. But you can't butt heads, right? Because force against force makes more force. And my God will, I just think it's funny, it's like it, you touch their gun and it turns into butterflies is what it looks like. So I started talking to this guy and I started giving him some testimonies of how God works in my life and how um, God is actually a God who speaks to me. God does not speak to you. You can't tell me this. You hear him? Yeah, I hear him. More importantly, I see him. So we get, we get into the trip and I say, actually, you know what? Sometimes God does some pretty crazy stuff that even blows my mind as much as I've been doing this. And sometimes, sometimes he will tell me things about people that I shouldn't know. What does this mean? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And um, I wasn't even meaning to full-on minister at this point. Um, I was just trying to give him an example. And I said, sometimes when I'm speaking to somebody, I get this, this picture in my mind. And sometimes it looks like February 17th, um, 1962, you know? That's just weird. <laughs> get out of here. What? What? That you cannot know this. You cannot know this. This is, it's not on my profile. It's not on anything. You cannot know this. What are you talking about, Nabil? This is my birthday. I, his exact birthday. Month, day, year. I see you, Jesus. I see you. So right there, I knew that I was tapping into the vein. You know, I knew that God was getting work done. So what's really great is through this excitement, I had to ask Nabil to be quiet, okay? Nabil, don't say anything, okay? This is the Lord. I'm hearing from him, and everything I say to you is going to be so true and so real. So I didn't want him to be like, confirm it, you know? Yeah, 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 I do got... I told him how many kids he had. I told him how old his kids were. I told him a boy and a girl. I said that the girl is older than the boy. And the girl is mad at you right now because you want her to marry a Muslim man. And yeah, he might be a doctor or a lawyer, but that's not who she loves. And she's not even sure she wants to be a Muslim. I am telling you guys, this was all correct. Super, super awesome. And then I went on to his son and I say, I see dolphins and I see bears. And I don't know what that's about, but oh, dolphins, bears, his his football scholar, like he had like a football like scholarship thing to go either play with the dolphins or the bears. Nabil, Nabil, be quiet. Shh. Stop. <laughs> Don't tell me anything. Because it's really fun when God gets to do that kind of stuff. And out throughout this conversation with him, I even outlined the troubles that he was having with his wife. I do not know this man. You know what I mean? But God knows this man. God's been with this man since he was born. God knows the way that Nabil breathes. He knows the way that he eats. He knows the way that he sleeps. And he knows what he's going through. And for a Muslim man to hear Jesus tell him everything about himself. And when he said, you're crazy, you're a prophet, you're a psychic, you're this. No, I'm Theophilus, I am a lover of God. So I'm just, I just really like, and then by the end of it, I said, as Nabil goes, so does the rest of his family, because he is a really, you know, he's a really big staple in his family, and that religion is a big staple in his family. And this man, when we got to hold him, was the biggest crybaby I've ever seen in my life. I mean, just melted, just big, big black guy. And he just melted in the presence of Jesus. And I got to bring that. I got to do that. But I'm not anybody more special than anybody in this room. 
other than I said, yes, Lord. Other than I saw that person at Walmart and I said, yes. Me and my kids would go and we would pray all the time. And Peyton has really challenged me because we're starting this thing, Peyton. We're going to go pray for people because that's what God says to do. And we're praying for people. We'd go to Walmart. We'd go to the laundromat. And one time there's this guy in a wheelchair. And I walked by him and Peyton said, what are you doing? So what do you mean, what am I doing? So let's go pray for that guy. That's right. Let's go pray for that guy. Who are you passing up? Is he in a wheelchair? Is that too hard for you? It's not too hard for God. Bolster your faith, everybody. Be bold. Be strong and courageous. Go love somebody. Go pray for somebody. Most of all, just ask them how they're doing. How are you? Is everything okay? I just want to let you know that I care about you. And I don't even know you, but I love you. You know why I love you? Because he loves you. And I'm feeling what he's feeling for you right now. And you'll make it through this. It'll get better. You know what I mean? Go love somebody. I just really want to encourage you guys today. So I hope I've encouraged you. I just want to, I just want to pray, and then I'll be done. Father, I thank you that your word does not return void, God. I thank you that you're bolstering the faith in this church and in these people right now. Um, God, I like, I like how the young kids came in right now. I just ask you to put an anointing of boldness over them, that they will speak and preach the gospel, that they will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed, that they will pray for the dead and they will raise God. I thank you that there isn't a single demonic force that has a stronghold on anybody in this church. We just command it to leave right now in Jesus' name. I just pray a blessing over you guys to be strong and courageous and to preach the unfiltered gospel of love. I thank you, Jesus, that we are seed planters and not soul winners. God, I thank you that you add the increase, God. And I thank you, God, that we can handle the increase. I thank you, God, that we are bold, that we are loving, we are kind. And I thank you, God, that it's our job to stand at the gates of hell and redirect traffic. I thank you, Jesus, that you are God and that you are good. We worship you, Jesus. We love you. There's no one like you. We magnify your name. King of kings and Lord of lords and lover of our soul. There's no one like you. Beautiful Jesus, as we go into this week, God, I ask you to be our eyes. I ask you to be our heart, God. I ask you to be our mouth, God. Father, and I thank you that when we step, you step. That when we say, you say, God. God, I just ask that we're attentive to your spirit. And that we can love people the way you love them and see them the way you see them. Jesus, thank you.